Good guys. So I appreciate I'm in between you and a disgusting amount of alcohol. So I will try to keep it as entertaining as possible. Welcome to Untrusted Execution, um, attacking the cloud native supply chain. I'm Francesco. I will introduce myself momentarily. For now, I want to thank Team uh, Myra, right? Mira, Mira, and all these guys again for the wonderful job. Right, so who am I? Um, I studied a fair amount of years in Italy, and then I moved, uh, I joined the ranks of the European government as a security engineer. I was looking at uh, data security, uh, system security, network security for them for about four years and a half. And then I joined Imarsat, a global satellite mobile provider, uh, as chief security engineer for the satellite control center. Then I moved into head of security operations engineering, so my team would look after the technology staff back uh, to support security operations for the company worldwide. And then I expanded the role, became head of security engineering for the company. So my team, a bigger one, would also consult uh, to the internal business units of the organization um, on their projects, right, to, um, on the security architecture, engineering uh, um, spaces. And then I didn't want to see a data center or a network cable in my life again, so I joined Control Plane, where I'm the security engineering manager. Control Plane is a cloud native security consultancy established in 2017, uh, based in London, but we operate worldwide. We have offices in uh, New York and in New Zealand as well. We are security specialists in cloud, Kubernetes, and containers, and we work really well with heavily regulated industries. Uh, again, we are uh, big advocates of deeply threat modeled uh, security architectures, cloud native security architectures. We also try to fill the gap between cloud native platforms and security operation centers. And we like very much to harden system and software de development life cycles and supply chains, and we pen test all the above. Right, so what are we going to talk about today? Uh, so through a very simple uh, case study, we'll try to define the uh, software supply chain problem, or one of the problems. And then uh, once the problem space is identified, uh, we will use threat modeling as a technique to navigate through this problem space, considering that your organizations have limited resources to secure your software supply chains. And we'll do that uh, by looking at three stages of your software supply chains. The pre-build, the build, and the post build, and we try to harden those three. Right, so let's start from the basics. Uh, what is a supply chain? Which is basically anything that you depend upon to do business, right? In the military sector, uh, they need to know uh, really well where all the hardware and software come from um, to protect against uh, state attacks. In the pharmace pharmaceutical sector, uh, it's also very important to know things like the provenance of all their ingredients uh, because it's um, they produce drugs, and those drugs are um, human safety critical. Right, so what is a supply chain? We'll go through, as I said, a reference architecture, basically from your upstream suppliers, uh, you know, third-party libraries you ingest, uh, software you consume from third parties, your own repositories, uh, your own developers, your um, own identity and access management platforms, all the way to your downstream customers. Everything that you see here in the picture is your software supply chain. What's in between? Something like that. So, three stages, as I said. A pre-built stage where you effectively fetch your own source code, you put it together with all the dependencies you need to run your applications, and then you make it available to a build stage. In the build stage, you effectively build your application, you test it, and you publish it somewhere. And, this, and from this somewhere, uh, your runtime hopefully will fetch uh, your artifacts, your, your, your application will execute it uh, somewhere and make it available to your uh, downstream customers um, ready to buy lots of items from your e-commerce. Right, so intuitively this is quite complex, right? What are the existential questions that security professionals like me uh, ask ourselves uh, when looking at those things? Uh, where does our code come from? Uh, where does it go? Uh, what do we actually ingest from third parties, especially? Uh, how it can go wrong, and what are we going to do about it? So, what is the supply chain problem? I'll give an example. Another ex reference architecture, we have a Kubernetes cluster right here in the center. We have a CI CD pipeline on the right hand side that's in pink. You have your third party. Um, 
trusted producers or the dependencies you ingest, and then you have an attacker with two vantage points. One is the public internet. Many attackers do have that vantage point. And the second one is one of the trusted producers of your organization that uh, got compromised by our Captain Hasjack on his boat. So let's say that the attacker managed to sneak a malicious payload, in this example is going to be a reverse shell, into one of the many libraries you ingest automatically upon executing your CI-CD pipelines, right? So at the next run, something triggers the pipeline execution, that malicious dependency is uh, ingested, baked into your trusted uh, in-house built code into, for example, an image. And the image goes into an execution in the form of a container, run into a pod perhaps, in this example, and it contains the uh, malicious uh, dependency, which executes, uh, detonates, upon being executed on the workload, the, re the reverse shell beacons out to the vantage point on the internet uh, the attacker controls, and through that, again, this is an egress connection, so it's more, uh, it's more difficult to detect uh, than an ingress connection to your application. Um, the attacker can piggyback into that um, is egress establish connection and establish presence in the workload and can run whatever they want with the permissions of the workload itself. So they compromised our infrastructure through compromising one of the uh, libraries we actually ingest from a trusted producer. Right, so that's one of the ways to uh, attack and compromise uh, through a supply chain. Um, other ways, in fact, the source code itself, so they may target uh, the developer's machines or the source repository. They may target uh, the build infrastructure directly, any of the components, or they can target directly the runtime, so where you run your applications. In any case, your downstream customers will be affected, your reputation will be affected too. So, bottom line, problem space is big. Why is that? Software supply chains can be very complex, um, and because of their complexity, the amount of data you ingest from the outside world at, uh, when you execute your CI-CD pipelines. Because of this complexity, they introduce many, many blind spots, uh, sometimes non-deterministic behaviors that you need to manage. So problem space is large, and that's because of their complexity, the software supply chain complexities. So what do we do about it? We don't use them. That's a little late for that. Or we use them, but we don't really care. But really something you really want to do or we try to secure everything but you know all of us we have a budget right which means we can't really do that so that's what we do for a living we threat model software supply chains and as well we ad develop and adopt standards best practices reference architectures and we keep improving them as i will show you later so theory and after the theory let's talk about threat modeling Threat modeling supply chains. What is threat modeling, right? It's a systematic approach that aims at bringing everyone at the same table, at every level, techies, non-techies. Uh, it focuses on data and data flows. It fundamentally wants to derive two things, uh, security risks and controls to mitigate those risks. It's an iterative approach, you keep doing it, and it's uh, divided in four stages. The four stages that we usually uh, adopt are these four. We ask ourselves, uh, what are we building with the guys at the table? And that's why it's very important threat modeling happens as soon as possible in the design process of your supply chains. Um, what's the worst that could happen? And then we ask ourselves uh, how we can actually reduce the risk of bad things happening. Step four, we measure our, uh, our job. Did we actually do a good job? And then, based on the ever-evolving threat landscape, we update the threat model, we keep up to date with the infrastructure changes, and then we start again. Step one, what are we building? Scope. Defining the scope is really important. Scope down to supply chain components and their trust boundaries. Uh, make sure it's manageable. If it's too big, scope it down to smaller components and then run a threat model, independent threat models, but reference each other, right? So make sure you catch those toxic combinations uh, between these threat models. Something innocent in one component plus something innocent in another component, the two together may be a threat. Identify data flows. Identify the business impact 
what's your confidentiality, integrity, and availability impact uh, for compromises on the components of your supply chain, right? Understand what the software supply chain is used for, right? And the operating model behind it. And then here comes the fun. Uh, what's the worst that could happen? Define your doomsday scenarios, right? And then identify the threats and the threat actor that could actually uh, achieve uh, those doomsday scenarios through defining their attack paths and document those attack paths um, through attack trees. For the less security um, experienced people in the room, we'll do it in a moment, so it become more and more uh, clear. Right, step three, basically, we know the threats, we know the attack paths, let's try to derive controls. Security controls uh, to de-risk uh, those uh, threats, and those can be preventative or detective, uh, uh, or both uh, controls. And again, standards and architectures, well-architected frameworks exist to ensure control, um, set and principle completeness. Again, budget implications, the threat model and the impact of those threats will uh, define your prioritization. Try to mitigate the most impactful one first. Controls, as I said, break the attack chain. This is an example of a attack tree the security controls break the, break the attack chains. They make an attack either too expensive for the attacker or impossible to achieve. Step four, did we do a good job? Again, residual risk analysis. Are those threat mitigated? Yes. Good enough. No. We have to invest more money. Define test suites to make sure the implementation of those security controls can actually withstand uh, the attacks. And then pen test manually, revise the model, and start again. Enough of the theory. Go back to the, uh, let's go back to the reference architecture and let's start threat modeling the pre-build. Again, the pre-build stage is essentially when in your software supply chain, you get your own develop, your in-house developed code, your application, you pull all the dependencies, that's the pre-build, right? This is how it looks like. Um, step one, we define the scope and trust boundaries. And we do that for each entity if you have the time and, and mind to do so. So the uh, workers running your, your, your pipeline, the, the fetch itself, the fetch operation itself, uh, the development workstations, the repositories, the third party repositories, the identity and access management uh, um, database that you use, uh, those are the, uh, that's our scope and those are the trust boundaries of the individual components. Then what we do, define data flows and classification. Data flows from uh, the development workstation to the private repository and from there into the fetch, wherever that runs on Git, whatever CICD platform you use. Same happens for the third party repositories. The classification of those data flows is very different, right? You don't trust what you ingest from your own uh, GitLab um, as much as, you know, you, you don't really trust what you ingest from the outside uh, compared to what you ingest from, you know, your in house uh, version controlled uh, repositories. First step, enumerate threats. This is when uh, we, we sit down with all these great engineers uh, and they start asking the famous question, how do we do it? How do they do it? Uh, we'll come to that in a moment, but how do bad guys actually do that? And then you got the manager saying, why would anybody do that to my organization? I can't think of a reason or two, but <laughs> I'll leave it to that. Examples, you may um, ingest compromised uh, party dependencies. Uh, you may have inadvertent inadvertently onboarded a rogue vendor. You may not have uh, established uh, sufficient software assurance guarantees uh, to the software you ingest. Or when you fetch, perhaps uh, there could be somebody uh, performing a not authorized uh, change to your pipeline, so changing your fetch job to grab something else. Um, they could compromise the workloads, or they could compromise the infrastructure itself. But again, they could target the workstations. They could target identity repositories, add a rogue identity, and do whatever they want. Or they could uh, target directly the source control um, repositories, source controlled repository. Now, uh, as we identify threats, we assign an impact, we assign a risk to them, an impact against confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and we start building attack trees. And those look really cool. Attack trees, again, is a, are formed by the attack chains, and they represent the tactical steps attacker may do to get, or may perform to get to the doomsday scenarios that you identify step two of the threat modeling. But, you know, 
you only identify threats to get to the next stage, identify controls. And those are all the controls you can implement uh, to make it mitigate each threat. A few examples, again, against uh, ingesting uh, a malicious payload, uh, gather and uh, analyze uh, the, your supply chain metadata. See what the vendors make available to you. S-bombs, VAX documents, SAS attestations, uh, scans they provide to you. But verify that too, right? Uh, don't trust them. Scan everything you ingest, or maybe the more um, obscure dependencies you ingest. Run uh, software composition analysis. Run uh, static analysis. Detonate those libraries into sandboxed, <laughs> sandbox. Um, and eventually, introduce a pipeline defined as code, right? I'm sure you all know what those are. So make sure that you have a, a two keys principle to make any change to your pipeline so that the fetch does one thing and one thing only. And perhaps uh, make sure the fetch uh, job can only connect to a number of whitelisted uh, trusted repositories. Harden your workstations, uh, use ephemeral workstations if possible, and then introduce cool things like you know, asking developers to sign each commit and harden the, the, the repositories themselves. So we identify controls, and we then, because we are still hopefully in the design stage of our software supply chain, we can harden it a little bit. So from a simple fetch, now this turned into a fetch, a risk-aware software ingestion for any third-party dependency, after the, uh, we do also an analysis of all those dependencies, we scan all that code, and eventually we make it land on our uh, build infrastructure. Let's talk about the build. Same thing. Define the build, define the core components, scope it to the individual components, establish the trust boundaries. The build does one job, the test does another job, the publish does another job, and all those are individual tasks, and you want to really establish those trust boundaries. Anything that the build ingests is a data flow. Anything that the build sends to the test or all the data exchange between the two um, steps is also a different data flow. And the same goes for the test to publish and the publish to the external artifact storage you may want to use between a build and your runtime. Same thing. Enumerate threats. What can go wrong, right? So somebody may inject some malicious stuff uh, during the build or uh, when you publish the artifacts. They can target your build process itself. They, compromise, uh, they can compromise your uh, build workloads. Say so use things like Tecton. They can target your individual workloads. Or they can compromise the underlying infra build infrastructure. As well as tamper with your test report saying, oh, this piece of code is perfect. It's all good, can go in execution into production, as well as uh, uh, tamper with those reports uh, or um, you know, leverage the fact that you don't really do enough security testing. They can tamper with artifacts or with the metadata generated by your pipeline as soon as they land on the storage. Those are all scenario, possible scenarios. As we enumerate threats and we come up with scenarios, we document them all. We keep building our attack trees, right? They become more and more complex, but that's when it becomes really cool, right? You see all these uh, uh, possibilities that we have to mitigate. And after that, controls are only useful if you then implement them. So what are the controls we select uh, to harden the build? Well, you can, again, define pipelines as code. Make sure you have the two keys principle enforced. Um, to authorize changes to your pipelines. Um, analyze uh, your build process. Gather that metadata and then make, uh, have an independent uh, analysis done and make sure the build process happens as it's supposed to. Uh, harden ephemeral build environments are always good. You know, you have to do a new build, spin up infrastructure, spin up the pipeline, build the code, build your application, sign it, store it in the artifact repository, and then scrap down everything, just tear down the infrastructure. You minimize the uh, compromise window. So if something did go wrong, if this infrastructure was compromised, tear it down, uh, and that will all um, hopefully go. Um, and then if you're really into security, you can introduce uh, workload attesters to make sure that only authorized workloads are admitted, and as well as infrastructure attesters to make sure that only cluster authorized cluster nodes can join your, your clusters. Sign your test reports and introduce robust uh, um, static and dynamic analysis. And again, sign your images, generate uh, 
all that pipeline metadata, sign it and store it somewhere safe so that further down the pipeline or the supply chain, um, those artifacts and that metadata can be independently verified. Controls are selected, but they're useful to then make it look better. So we don't just do build, test, and publish. After the test, uh, we do a verification of the build process, uh, generate a um, software bill of material, sign and attest all that uh, artifacts and metadata, and we publish all that, again, to be consumed uh, down the supply chain. Last, threat modeling the post build. Right, that's the last step. So in the post build, again, something fetches um, artifacts, whether those are images or whatever, and they execute and the fetch then execute those, uh, sorry, the pipeline then execute those artifacts into your runtime. Again, scope and trust boundaries. Scope to the post build, and the trust boundaries are the individual tasks, and the post build environment itself. Uh, Kubernetes is an example. Um, then don't forget you got your downstream uh, customers waiting to connect your application. Data flows, again, artifacts flow coming from the uh, store to an external storage um, into your runtime, executed, so artifacts are shared between the fetch and the executed job, and then you also you have the most untrusted the, uh, data flow, which is from the outside world, from your customer to your APIs or uh, frontends. Again, what can go wrong? Let's enumerate threats. The fetch can, if it's not properly locked down, the fetch can actually be instructed to pull a rogue artifact. That could be a CI CD bypass. So somebody may execute something in runtime uh, if there is a weak admission control in place, right? Uh, there could be a, still a residual security flaw in your application that could, again, work, uh, compromise the workloads. Uh, they can compromise the runtime itself. They can compromise the underlying infrastructure. And we keep building the tree and we eventually get to the doomsday scenarios, right? So from the bad guys all the way to the doomsday scenarios through a number of tactical steps, <clears throat> excuse me, steps that the attacker may perform. So that controls, pipeline as code, again, uh, validate, uh, validate anything you actually fetch from the artifacts uh, storage, validate the hash bomb, verif verify image signatures, and then uh, confirm provenance from eventually a transparency log. So you independent, the runtime independently verifies that the software was built according to uh, um, the process you had in mind and nothing went wrong in between and everything is cryptographically verified. Um, for the application, good old pen test, you know, web app pen testing. Uh, and then the good old web application firewalls, those are still very valid controls. Harden your Kubernetes, if that's your runtime, harden your underlying infrastructure, uh, again, using um, node and workload attestation. Controls are selected. Let's try to harden our initial post build into something more secure. Fetch code, validate every artifact, analyze the metadata, validate things like S bombs do your provenance checks, and only at that point, uh, execute at runtime. And that's the end-to-end, -end, again, from upstream suppliers all the way down to the downstream customer um, with some enhanced, uh, you know, with a, an enhanced security posture, hopefully. Again, based on the threat model you run, which is very organization-specific. Uh, it's very useful to your organization. Did we do a good job? Hopefully we did. So you map controls uh, to the attack trees, and you eventually see that the attack can't be done anymore. Those doomsday scenarios, they can't be performed, or it would take too long or too much money to, your, um, to, the, to, to the threat actors targeting your organization to actually perform the attack. So eventually they would give up, and they start looking elsewhere. Right, time to connect the dots, right? Everything I presented you so far is the result of field expertise, but also a bunch of incredibly useful resources, of course, all open source, uh, available to us. That's the time to take a picture, if you want. <laughs> Some pointers. The Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, put together uh, a goldmine of information called the Software Supply Chain Best Practices. We will talk about it in a minute. Um, and then those, you know, this white paper basically articulates the fund 
foundational principles to build uh, secure software supply chains. And from that, CNCF derived uh, a reference architecture called Secure Software Factory, which is again uh, split into three stages. Guess what? Pre-build, build, and post-build. It's me copying from them. It's not them who copied from me, right? Full disclosure. Um, this reference architecture, again, implements those principles and guidelines um, articulated in the white paper, and then based on the Secure Software Factory architecture, joined with, the, uh, with Salsa, which is a framework, we will talk about it in a moment, but is a framework to establish uh, and enhance uh, the security posture of your, of your um, supply chain, they put everything together into a technology stack uh, called Fresca. It's built on Kubernetes, stacked on uh, in total, and there is a bunch of things. We will look at it in a moment. And that's something you can literally download and run and play with it. And by design and by default implements those security principles through a reference architecture called Secure Software Factory. Right, white paper, security principles, four. Verification, automation, controlled environments, secure authentication and access. And those principles are exactly the guiding principles to any hardening that we do. So in verification, each stage of your uh, chain should be cryptographically verified and metadata should be attested. Automation, introduce deterministic CICD pipelines. Infrastructure as code is an excellent way to achieve that. Um, Try to remove the humans from the, uh, from the picture. Don't give the right access to uh, infrastructure or pipelines just through uh, version control. The um, pipe, def um, pipelines defined as code into version controlled repositories. Controlled environments. All entities, aka even the jobs, uh, uh, the fetch, the build, the test, uh, make sure they are clearly defined and limited in scope and they have just enough privileges to do uh, what they are meant to do. And that goes down even to storage. Say the fetch, for sure the fetch has to drop something, so it needs some network access, and it needs to store something somewhere. But then the build, perhaps the build doesn't need to have right access to the storage where the source code is, is, uh, is actually held. So those are little tricks uh, that you can use, uh, again, to implement uh, and enforce uh, strong list privileges, privilege for, your, um, for the jobs. Again, secure authentication and access, uh, all entities must be mutually authenticated, must mutually authenticate uh, through a number of techniques to make sure that only authorized party can join the party. Right, and that's into five stages, right? Securing the source code, everything we, 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 we build in-house and we ingest. Securing the materials, everything we ingest from the outside. Securing the build pipelines themselves. Securing the artifacts, which is something, whatever we produce. And secure the deployments, so everything that goes into your runtime. Software factory, the secure software factory, is again reference architecture uh, which adopts uh, the software factory paradigm. It's built on the white paper and implement things like, again, defense in depth, signing and verification throughout the, throughout the, 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 um, the architecture, um, analysis of artifact metadata, and automation from A to Z. And again, the cornerstones, um, it focuses around three critical concerns. Provenance verification, trustworthiness, and the dependencies of your, of your um, applications. And guess what? Split into three stages. Pre-build, fetch code, the build, and the post-build. Salsa, again, doing with time. Yeah, it should be okay. Salsa, a framework available to all. It's open source, of course. Incrementally adoptable uh, security guidelines. Uh, and there is a large consortium working behind it. Uh, uh, standards and control to prevent tampering, improve integrity, and secure packages and infrastructure of your supply chains, and establish a, a industry common language to assess, again, where you are and where you could get. The, the threat model behind Salsa is exactly that one. Salsa V1 focuses very much uh, now on pre-build and build, and uh, that's the threat model behind. So not the very far from what we talked about here, right? So we got threat actors that can do things uh, depending on the stage, uh, and they classify to uh, threats to the source and threats to the build. Those are the levels. At level zero, there is no expectation of you implementing anything. At level one, uh, they, the requirement is that there is provenance showing how the 
package was actually built, so all the build process documented uh, manually or, sorry, automatically. Uh, and it focused on mistakes and the documentation of the process itself. Level two, the provenance must also be signed automatically and must be generated by a wholesale build platform. And then at level three, this build platform must also be hardened, uh, focusing on, again, tampering that may happen during the build. And for level two, I forgot to mention, tampering that may happen after um, the build. Key takeaways. I hope you could appreciate how big the problem space could be of securing um, software supply chains. Recommendation is always to threat model everything. Again, that comes from experience. Um, you have to, read, to get the right people with the right expertise at the table. Principles, frameworks, guidelines, and controls are available, all open sourced. Careful about retrofitting that security uh, into your software supply chains. Something will break, so slowly mature um, and uh, try to establish a security roadmap to harden, again, supply chains. You're not alone. Join and contribute to the community. Free book, Hacking Kubernetes, uh, written by our CEO, Andy Martin, available by scanning the QR code. And that's the end of it. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Francesco. Uh, we do have a few questions. Um, I'll uh, go through them. Uh, theoretically, most destructive threat doesn't imply most relevant. How do you judge likelihood ease of attacks to truly focus on the most important weakness? Whomever asked this, can, can you stay here for a while? Because it's a, it's a long answer. Um, <sighs> over a beer, maybe. Huh? Over, over a beer, over yeah. A beer, maybe. If, if, you don't, if you don't drink alcohol. That's a lot over I need to think about. I can't give an immediate answer. Fair enough. Most Whoever asked the question, uh, please come and relevant. Uh, fetch Francesco afterwards. Please stay. We'll talk about it. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, will you share the slides? Of course. Uh, um, again, just come and uh, I can get you the PDF. Uh, I, I have it. I can, uh, unless these are made available through the CDS website. No, they won't be. But uh, if you follow, do you have to? Uh, Twitter, X, whatever it's yeah, called just, nowadays. Or, or come, I'll give you the PDF via email or whatever. You can connect over the app, over the um, um, uh, Container Days application as well. It's got sure. uh, Francesco's all handles. Sure, as well. Yeah. Um, then, should I start working on the five steps of security in the, o in the order you had on your slide or backwards or in any other order? Based on experience, uh, Typically, um, unless you do something really stupid in your build and post build, the most risky stuff is whatever you pull from the outside world. That's where I would start, personally. If you need help to justify that to your manager, just let me know, right? You can build a, a story to get a narrative together. Uh, cool. Oh, right. And then that's the, it. The, the complex one. Yeah. Um, that's it, Francesco. Thank you very much for staying so long. Yeah. Right on time, minus 10. Yeah. <laughs> Countdown. <laughs>